in America, San Francisco, you jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and you're one of the very f few survivors. I made my way out to the Golden Gate Bridge, crying like a child, wishing, praying someone would stop me. I walk out on the walkway and then I jumped. In the millisecond, my hands left the rail. Instantaneous regret. This creature circles beneath me, bumping me up. And I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. How many people have actually jumped off? Every time I tell a media outlet the truth about this story, they bury it. This is the emotional story of Kevin Hines. Kevin Hines sadly tried to take his own life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Typically, only 1% of individuals who jump survive and if they do, they have life-changing injuries. Kevin Hines remarkably came out unscathed. He now is a suicide prevention advocate as well as a public speaker. I have the pleasure of interviewing him with this exclusive podcast episode. Enjoy, be happy, never content, and make sure you subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, The Stephen Sully Study. Um, everybody knows that I love a good conversation, a good episode, good story, and something that motivates and inspires the younger demographic, because that's my mission. I've interviewed go-getters, entrepreneurs, athletes, people in music. I think the story we're about to have is a very different one. It's gonna be very emotional. It's gonna be quite hard for some people to listen to, but at the end of it, there's a positive, inspirational journey that has been uh, lived by this man, Kevin Hines. So, Thank you very much for your time today and welcome to the UK because you're from San Francisco, correct? Yeah, well, thank you for having me here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being on the podcast with you. I'm from San Francisco, lived there the first 34 years of my life. And then seven years ago, my wife up and moved out to Atlanta. Oh, a lovely part of the world. Yeah. I just went there uh, on the Gumball Rally, actually. I only spent uh, a couple of days there. Very, very cool city. Yeah. Them guys know how to party there. Yeah, they do. <laughs> So look, um, if we can get to like, you know, the, the, the crux of, you know, your journey, your story, um, and obviously walk us through it quite slowly so everyone really appreciates exactly what you were going through. I'm gonna paraphrase some stuff just to get, get, get it going. So as you mentioned, you're, you're from San Francisco originally. I still haven't been there. My wife has been there and she says it's absolutely incredible. So I've got, got to go over there and I'm sort of digressing, but it's something called Fleet Week in San Francisco, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I'm into my aeroplanes, my fighter hey. jets and stuff. So I'm going to be going there at some point when that's on. Oh, that's incredible. When you go, if you go there Fleet Week, you're going to really enjoy yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm that, that's my kind of, kind of weekend, like seeing stuff yeah. like that. It's, it's, it's really cool. So at nine months old, you were adopted. Yeah. Um, I also got here that you, you, you did suffer or do suffer from epileptic seizures. Quite I live with epilepsy. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. And then around about 16 years of age, you, I don't know whether the right word is diagnosed or you had symptoms of bipolar. At 17 and a half, I had a complete mental breakdown in front of 1200 people in a theater show. I was on stage as one of the leads, complete mental breakdown, ran off middle of the show. They had to stop the show. They had to send on the director to play my role for the rest of the, the, rest of the episodes, you know, the, the, the showings. And um, I, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, I lost my mind. Mm -hmm. And it was at 17 and a half years of age. Yeah. And um, again, I, I've got a, a note here that, you know, you were very, very, um, upset and moved by a, a drama teacher taking their own life. And in actual fact, in 2000, you actually wrote your own suicide note. And obviously I'm paraphrasing, there's more more information there, which I would like to drill down into. But then there was this moment on the, the 25th of September 2000 uh, in America, San Francisco, you jumped off the very famous bridge, which is called the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and you're one of the very f few survivors. So if we can backtrack a little bit, walk me through that, you know, at a yeah. young age, like how did this kind of scenario pa pan out? Yeah, so I mean, if we're really gonna break it down, um, we have to start at the beginning. So I was born in abject poverty, lived in and out of crack motels. These are the kind of places you pay for by the hour, and if you don't, you're out. And my birth parents, as I'm adopted, they did whatever the hell they had to do to pay on that hour by that hour to keep a roof over me and my brother's head. 
And that meant they were leaving us as infants unattended day by day, night by night to go do score and sell drugs. And that neglect led to us being malnourished. We were fed what mom and dad could steal. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my first diet. Um, we had distended bellies filled with liquid, a bruise from the top of our sternum to the bottom of our abdomens from being malnourished for so long. That set the tone for what was to come. And, and, and that trauma, because it was trauma, that trauma that occurred, uh, no, no child should have to go through. And we, we get taken away by Child Protective Services. We get placed into foster care. And we're just neglected in every foster home. One of those homes, we both get a vicious strain of bronchitis. And my only full-blooded brother, Jordash, dies uh, right near me. And I immediately developed a severe detachment disorder from reality and abandonment issues that follow me until today. So that set the tone for me. I get adopted by a beautiful family, the Heinz family. It's my mom and dad. They take me in, they make me their son. They take in two other kids from two separate families. So we're just this melting pot of a family. Uh, my, my mom is from Jamaica. She's black, African, Arawak, Indian, Portuguese. My dad's Italian, Mexican. And uh, my brother's black from a different family. My sister's white. So we're just this really colorful family. And people were really confused when they saw us walking down the street. They're like, what is happening over there? People would literally like point and stare at us, you know. Um, but, but we were happy, you know, all was well. Then 17 and a half years of age, it all comes crumbling down. I have a breakdown, I go see a psychiatrist, I get diagnosed as bipolar, I, I have this diagnosis, uh, bipolar type one with psychotic features, I start having hallucinations, auditory and visual, manias, when you go up, you go down, crashing into depressions, panic attacks, heart palpitations, I thought I was having a heart attack all the time, it was a terrifying feeling. All these things are culminating. And by 19, I couldn't bear the weight and the brunt of the pain any longer. We had a conversation before we started about pain, right? Mm. Uh, my perspective on pain is that pain is universal. That pain is in fact inevitable. It's, it's, it's coming for all of us if it hasn't already, but suffering is optional, it's a choice. So I didn't look at it like that years ago. But today I look at pain as a choice, suffering as a choice because if I can, if I can harness the pain that I experience mentally, if I can control it and hold gratitude inside my pain that I can survive it. And so can anyone else. And that can be taught. Not everybody is born resilient. Not everybody is taught resilience. As a matter of fact, far too many people around the world don't have, are lacking in resilience right now, especially our, our young people. You know, if we look at the stats of suicide uh, amongst, amongst the youth in England, in America, around the world, um, there's so many of these kids who are lacking in any ability to fight their pain. And it's because they're being, they're being uh, educated on these. They, they are drowning in data from these at such a young age that they're not learning how to have interpersonal connections with real people. Think of all the kids who grew up with a cell phone in their hand from the age of 10. We didn't have that. Hmm. We had a time in our lives when cell phones didn't exist. They, don't, they have no memory of that. And it, ma it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. Uh, but back to the story at hand. I, uh, I, I'm diagnosed bipolar. Two years pass. I'm, I'm unfocused. I'm unwell. Having a really hard time. And I'm on medication. But I'm, I wasn't taking it properly. I was taking the meds one day and not the next. Seven days and not for seven days. Or while binge drinking until blackout on the weekends. Which could have killed me. But I wasn't trying to get high or feel this buzz. I was trying to stop the voices I was hearing in my head, the auditory hallucinations. So at 19, I, I hit my breaking point. It was too much weight to bear. And I broke. And I made my way out to the Golden Gate Bridge on a bus, crying like a child, hoping anyone would stop me, wishing, praying someone would stop me, and nobody does. 
The bus gets to the Golden Gate Bridge. I walk out on the walkway. I pick a particular light rail. I lean over that light rail and I'm just profusely crying my tears to waters below. And the odd part is that bikers, joggers, tourists, runners, patrol officers searching for suicidal people, they went by me twice. A woman approached me from my left and she smiled at me. I thought, oh, this lady's going to save my life. I don't have to do this. I don't have to die anymore. I literally left the fate of my life in this complete stranger's hands, which wasn't fair. She can't read my mind. She approached. I awaited for the are you okay? And instead she pulls out a digital camera and says, will you take my picture? And I had to laugh at this accent and I was like, terrible timing, you know? I took her picture five times and she walked away. And I said to myself, absolutely no one cares, which has to be the single greatest lie I've ever told myself. And then I jumped. The millisecond my hands left the rail, instantaneous regret. What the fuck did I just do? I'm going to die and I don't want to. And I thought it was too late. Four second fall, so rapid, hit the water, like hitting a solid brick wall. Because you're falling at a velocity at which it's, it's, it, you're nearing the speed of turn of velocity. You're closing in at 80 miles per hour. I hit the water. The impact shattered my T12, L1, L2 lower vertebrae. I missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters. Millimeters. And... Uh, to say that I am lucky to be alive is an understatement. 99.9% .9 of the people who have leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge never get to speak again. They're gone. I get to be here. And no matter the pain I'm in, because I'm in a lot of pain, excruciating physical pain most of the time from what I did, certainly a great deal of brain pain from what I live with, uh, no pity needed, part of the deal. I get it and I got it. And I, I, it, it doesn't bother me anymore. It's just part of what I go through. And uh, to, I, I, I get to be here and getting to be here is a privilege and a gift no matter the pain I might be in. Wow, man, that is, you, I, I just, you hear about certain stories through friends, loved ones, family members, then you see things in the movies, then you see things on the news, and you can't really just get your head around like going through that scenario, like emotionally in, in your own mind, but then actually following the act through. And to be here to, to tell the story is just like, again, I've said this word a few times, mind blowing. The statistics. So we were just talking off air about the statistics, about the amount of people that have gone to the Golden Gate Bridge, because it's a famous bridge that... Yeah. It's famous for two reasons. One, because it's a, a great bridge, but two, because unfortunately, so many people have taken their own lives by jumping off of it. Yeah. So how many people have actually jumped off? How many people survived? But how many people are still coherent and not disabled from the, from the act? So I'll tell you, and this is what really makes me sad, is that... Every time I tell a media outlet the truth about this story, they bury it. Every single time I tell media what the real numbers are, they go back to the numbers that the bridge district, the authority who runs and owns the bridge, has maintained for so long. The bridge directorate would like the world to believe that 1,800 people have died off the Golden Gate Bridge. That is utter and complete bullshit. The number is more like 3,000, 4,000 or higher for all the bodies washed away to see never to be found, for all the partial bodies that are found that are never, never counted, for all the bodies that are eaten by fish to the bone and never found. And the fact is that the, Marine, the former Marine coroner, when the Golden Gate Bridge District would say that 34 people died this year, the Marine coroner would come out and say it was more like 60. 
when the when the when the Golden Gate Bridge districts would say, "Oh, 45, 47 people died this year," the 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 patrol officers of that era would come say it was more like sixty or seventy or higher. They have been lowering and and stifling the numbers for decades. It makes me very angry because it's, it's not a, it's not a true understanding of how many people have actually died there, nor does it respect the people's families that lost those loved ones. And it, 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 it breaks my heart because we're, we're denying those truths. Um, and so, so of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the jumpers, the, the number today is that 99.3% are fatal of jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's because the uh, Marin, Marin Health Center, which used to be Marin General Hospital, the place I went to when I jumped, has built an entire unit to to keep people alive from those who survive off the Golden Gate Bridge. They've created a whole unit that actually uh, helps to stabilize someone who survived off the Golden Gate Bridge. And they've now lowered the fatality rate of that by the work they have learned to do, which is incredible, just incredible. So that all started, that unit was created in part because of me coming in as a survivor because they didn't know what the hell they were doing. When I came in in the year 2000 as a survivor off the Golden Gate Bridge, they, this was unheard of. They had, ne they had never experienced this. So they had, to, they had everybody and their mother coming around me to make sure I was physically going to be okay. Um, and so, so, so back then, 99.9% .9 fatality rate, 40 people since then in total, actually, pardon me, 40 people in total have survived the fall of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and that 26 of us remain alive today. Many have died of natural causes or old age. 19 have come forward like I came forward to say. They all had the same instant regret that I had. That's the majority of the people that are still alive. They all had the same instant regret that I had. That wages us to think, what about all the other people who've attempted suicide in all kinds of ways, mild to moderate to, to severe, who have died? How many of them had that same instinctual instant regret? People from all walks of life from all around the world who have recounted surviving their mild to moderate to severe suicide attempt have also recounted this instant regret. It's, it's fascinating. Um, and I believe it's because, like I did, they recognize in the moment they think it's too late that their thoughts don't have to become their actions. But, it, but they think it's too late. Their thoughts don't have to own, define, or rule what they do next. Um, so 40 survivors, 26 remain alive today, 19 have come forward to say they all had the same instant regret that I did, but only five of us get the privilege to stand, walk, and run. They call us the most exclusive survivors club in the world. There's a book of the same name that we're in by Ben Sherman. It's incredible. The fact that I get to sit across from this table next to you is a gift. You are my gift today, not the other way around. And that's the way I look at life. You know, when you, when you go through something like this, you see existence, pure existence, in a much different way. Your, your, your lens of life it's very different. When I wake up in the morning, I thank God I get to exist. Before I go to bed, I do the same. And that attitude has helped get me through the hardest of times. Because I still go through all my brain stuff. I still have brain pain. I still, you know, we, we, I still have the, the mental health crises that go on all the time. I still have chronic thoughts of suicide. I've had them for 22 years. But I've never attempted again. Because every time I'm suicidal, I say, I need help now to anyone willing to hear me. And if I, if I, if I came in this door suicidal, Stephen, I'd say it to you. And I guarantee you'd help me. Hmm. And that's, that's how I stay alive with this, this, this struggle every day. So going back to that moment then, you were literally looking for almost a way out when you was on the way to the Golden Gate and you were saying to yourself, the moment that someone actually honestly tries to help me, that is my sign of yeah. staying alive, but no one did. So this is also instinctual with suicidal people? If then. If one person says or does this, I will. If one person says or does this, I won't die today. 
People who have survived suicide attempts also recount that around the world. If then. Mine was if one person says, are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you? I would tell them everything and beg them to save me. It makes you think, you know, when you, you know, we, we all live separate lives. We all have different brains that uh, you know, there's no hive mind here. We're all trying to do the best for ourselves and succeed and accomplish and all that. But when you see someone in active, lethal, emotional pain, like you see someone on a bench crying their eyes out in public, no longer can we, those who are well, walk by that person. Mm. I believe it is our responsibility to walk up to that person, no matter the outcome, and say, hey, how you going? Can I help you? What's, what's going on here? Anything I can do? You're likely to get an answer, like, get the fuck out of here, get out of my face, leave me alone. I don't know, who, who are you? I've gotten that answer. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Kevin, and I, I'm a human being, and so are you, and you look like you're in pain. What's going on? What's, 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 got, what's got you feeling that bad? Mm. You would be astonished at how many people will open up to you when you do that, that are in that kind of pain. Because they want someone to be there for them. Because they feel like they have no one. They feel like they have nothing. Mm. And I was in San Francisco years ago, and I was on Market Street. And this six, she had to be 16 year old girl, dyed pink hair, wearing all black, black nail polish, black eye makeup, everything. And she was on, she was walking on and off the ledge of the street, the sidewalk, in front of traffic. I was like, she's gonna, she's gonna try to take her life. And people were just looking at her and walking by. I immediately walked up to her, I stopped right in front of her as she went back one time. And I was like, hey, you okay? And she was like, what do you care? And I literally said, well, I'm human and so are you. So I do. And you look like you're about to do something very dangerous. What's going on? She's like, you don't know me. I, I know I don't. I don't need to. I was where you were years ago. I, I attempted to take my life and I survived. I didn't say how. I said, I'm very, very blessed to be alive. You, you have no idea. I said, let's sit down over there and have a chat. And she was like, what? I said, look, you're, you're about to do something dangerous that could end your life. I'd like to prevent you from doing that, if I can. Will you just tell me your story? Tell me what is that bad that you have to do this? And she was like, she's crying her eyes out. And we sat down. It was like a it was like a parking ledge. We sat down. And she told me everything. I sat there for 45 minutes. Wow. She told me everything. I missed my meeting. I did I couldn't call anyone. I was focused. But I gave her my time. And she is alive today. Anybody can do that. Everybody can do that. Just doing communication with her? Yeah. 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 So, is it fair to say then you were in a state of, I don't know, anxiety and also mental trauma or depressed? You was going through depression. Is that is that why you felt the need to jump? I, I, I was... So I was hearing voices and seeing things that told me I had to die. So if you've never heard an auditory hallucination, for those of you who are listening or watching, um, imagine your, your headphones are on, your earbuds are in, and instead of that you know, musical playlist you have on uh, Spotify or Apple, or instead of that podcast or that audible book, instead you hear a person or people's voices in your head screaming at you things you have to do that you don't want to. Just yelling at decimals you can't express to people without piercing eardrums. You must die, jump now. 
you're useless, you're horrible, you're worthless. And that's what it would do. It would just tell me all the most terrible things about myself. And it didn't, it didn't sound like my conscience. It sounded like a third-party voice in my head, unlike anyone I've ever known or met. It's, it's, I don't know much about this subject, yeah. but it sounds like from an outsider having this conversation with me right now, it's like almost a bit schizophrenic. And that's what people th turn to. But so, so bipolar type one with psychotic features are just that. Those psychotic features include paranoid delusions, where you believe people are out to get you, trying to hurt you, trying to kill you. And then hallucinations, auditory and visual, where you hear voices and see things that don't exist to anyone but you. It's, a, it's at the very least definitely called psychosis. So I experience, without the medication I take or the routine I follow, I experience horrible psychosis. If I was here with you, unmedicated, and not on my very strict routine, you would see a much different Kevin. You would see a Kevin, even though we've talked for only a few minutes, that you wouldn't even recognize. And you know, you would see me talking over here to the person in the corner that doesn't exist to you. Um, uh, you would see me being feeling threatened by, uh, uh, paranoid, but that snipers were coming to kill us both. Uh, you would see me, and this has happened before, where I believe that houses were going to come alive and eat me, like. The psychosis I experience is legitimate, it is real, and it is terrifying. That's mind-blowing stuff. Um, your, yeah. your, your brain is that powerful. Yeah. If your brain is unwell, if your brain is malfunctioning, there goes the rest of you. So, okay. Jump in, you said about four seconds? Four second fall. Yep. Instant regret. Instant regret. Uh, I don't want to name any names, but there was someone in our, my wife's good friend's wife, who was also her friend, died. And there was this big conversation afterwards. She hung herself, but we are led to believe that she had instant regret because of the, the panic that there was markings and stuff. Um, they were drunk, they had an argument, and she thought, I'm going to show this person, I'm going to oh, wow. attempt to attempt to kill myself but with the with the understanding that the person is probably going to find them before they do it but they didn't and she went ahead with it yeah and it's and when you say the instant regret yeah. that's that's what it reminded me of instantaneously yeah like there must be so many people that have done that so the instant regret you jump off when you say instant regret you've only got four seconds to feel that instant regret so what was the that that feeling like or the that internal the, talk the millisecond my hands left the rail and you were free falling and i was free falling the moment the moment i could not reach back to the bridge i was like what the fuck did i just do no and as i fell these were the words that rang true in my mind what have i just done i don't want to die god please save me i hit the water and when I actually opened my eyes in the water and I was drowning 70 feet beneath the water surface, because you go down, you, you're sucked in a vacuum because you're falling at such a capacity, velocity. You're sucked in a vacuum down 70 feet. It's almost, you're almost at the bottom of the bay. You can almost touch the bottom. I frantically swam in any direction. I was going down. I, didn't, I couldn't tell which way it was up or down. My eyes began to bulge. My ears began to ring. Because of my swimming training, I knew I was going the wrong direction. I shot for the opposite direction. I shot as fast as my arms would take me. I couldn't feel my legs. They were working. And I broke the surface of the water, took a breath of air, having a violent asthma attack. And I kept going down in the water. I couldn't stay above the surface. I was not strong enough. I shattered my back and uh, I tried to scream for help, but all that came out was, help me, help me. My lungs have been impacted. I couldn't scream. I go down one more time and I'm, I'm, I'm sinking. I'm like, this is it. This is where I die. And nobody is going to know that I don't want to. No one's gonna know that I knew I made a mistake. What did I just do? And that's when something began circling beneath me. And this, this is the part which I find it's extraordinary. It's, it's unbelievable. It's like something, God sent something It's to like you. out of a movie. 
like this creature circles beneath me, bumping me up. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. And I really believed it was a shark. I thought at any minute it was going to take off a chunk of my leg or my arm or something and I'm done for. Because it's a great white breeding ground. But it didn't bite me. It's just circling faster and faster, faster and faster. No longer am I wading or treading, trying to get above water. I'm lying atop it on my back, being kept buoyant by this creature, thinking this is the nicest shark I've ever met. But it turns out it was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping my body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. How the fuck did it know? There, so this is the interesting part. If you go on, if you go on YouTube and you type in animals that have saved humans, there's about a thousand videos of animals from all, all over the world that have saved human beings. There's like a story about a cheetah that saved a baby that got separated from his parents. There's a story about dolphins who save human beings from sharks. There's a story about a cow saving a kid from something. I mean, it's wild, you know? And, and uh, mine always gets like top one or top three. A sea lion kept me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. Right. This is me just throwing a devil's advocate in now. Based upon what you told me earlier. Sure. You've probably been asked this. Yep. How do we not know it might have been the illusion Hallucination. that you used to have as a uh, bipolar sure. type sure. person? Sure. Sure. Very important question. Very, very important to to, to clarify. So... I never had that type of hallucination, A. The hallucinations I would have would be of a man in the corner of a room with a butcher knife in his hand ready to kill me. So that's number one. Number two, a man named Morgan McWard took pictures of the sea lion keeping me afloat, sent them to my father. They're, they're terrible. They're, not, they're great pictures. They're terrifying to look at. It looks like my lifeless body above the water and this creature circling me. And every, every, every frame of the picture... You can see the sea lion in a different position, circling beneath me. Next to that, there were at least three people that went to Cavallo Point to the Marin, uh, Marin uh, Coast Guard and recounted that exact situation, that a sea lion kept me afloat in the water, and that's an official documentation about my on my chart. So it absolutely happened. Wow. And I, and I because I remember, I tried to punch this thing, and, and my, my hand just kept sliding off its back. And when you, when you hit... What most people don't know is when you hit a shark with your hand, their their skin is like sandpaper. It's very it's very coarse. Uh, but when when you when you're pressing off a sea lion, it's very slippery, and my hand was just sliding off of it like that. A bit like a dolphin. A bit like a dolphin. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Or a porpoise. Or yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean they'd say a dog is a man's best friend, and the sea li <laughs> sea lion is is it, well, dog's the right. Uh, by the way, I named him Herbert. <laughs> well, if you're listening, to Herbert, thank you very much. Thank sir. you, Herbert. Because <laughs> um, a sea lion is, a, or the other way around, dogs are derived from sea lions. I think you know they're they're. They from say the same. they say they're sea dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah river, we call them river dogs. So hitting the water, right? I know you said so. I've got a very childlike mind because when I think about hitting the water, I'm like, yeah, it's, you, you're going to survive because you're hitting the water. If you hit concrete, I understand, but. Yeah. If you pencil like into the water, no, sure, surely, no. surely you're gonna survive. It's brutal. So, do you actually remember the impact? Oh my god! Like, like the actual like was... pain and the 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 speed and the sound. What what was that like? Like it was yesterday. I was falling head first. I knew immediately if I hit head first, I will die because you'll break your neck or yourself or you'll get decapitated. People get decapitated all the time. On the, off the Golden Gate Bridge. I threw my head back. I landed in the only position that anyone has ever survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, which I won't repeat because I don't want to give people ideas. Hit the water, the impact reverberated through my legs, shattered my T12L1, L2 lower vertebrae. And the vertebrae shattering is why I missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters, um, which is in, incredible by itself. Like, two millimeters away from certain death. Uh, and, and then 
you know, when, when you when you fall like that, um, I only had those few seconds to think, and that those are my those are my thoughts very rapidly. What if I just don't want to die? God, please save me. Hit the water, and that impact, it, the implosion that occurred inside me was excruciating. Obviously, a few minutes later, I went into shock. But before I went into shock, holy, oh, the pain was unbearable, unbearable. But then you then you get into this shock because partially because you're surrounded by such frigid waters, it's so cold, so that's all you feel. Um, but uh, but you go into shock because your your body can't handle the pain. Mind blown. So the the moment that the lifeguard boat came along, obviously the seal's gone now. You're on this lifeboat. Do you remember what happened at that point? Yeah, that was pretty incredible. The Coast Guard officers were phenomenal, um, as they are. They pulled me onto a flatboard, put me into a neck brace, strapped me in from head to toe, cut off my upper body clothing, searching for hemorrhaging, put a blanket over my body, and started asking questions. They're like, kid, do you know what you just did? I was like, yeah, I just jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And they said, why? I had no answer. I said, I don't know. I, th I thought I had to die today. They said, son, do you understand how many people we pull out of these waters that are already gone? I said, no, and I don't want to know. They said, we're going to tell you anyway. They said, young man, this unit alone, this year alone, has pulled out 26 dead bodies from these waters. And only one live one, you. With crystal clarity, I can tell you that gave me the greatest point of perspective I have ever received in my life. And in that boat, I made a cognitive decision. No matter the pain I would ever be in again, I would never attempt to take my life so long as I shall live. It's not the way I go out. It's not going to happen. And I have chronic thoughts of suicide, but they'll never kill me. Because every time they occur, every time, no matter where I am, or who I'm with or near, I will say, I need help now. And I'll tell that person exactly the thoughts that I'm having so they can help keep me safe. And they have for 22 years. People are like, people often say, well, what if you're alone? What if you have no one? Well, hold on. You turn to anyone around you and say, I need help now until you find someone to help you. And by the sheer probability of the number of people you turn to, somebody will be willing to empathize with your pain. Maybe not someone in the general public here in London, but certainly someone at the emergency room. Say it until you find it, the help you need, because you're worth it. Mm. Very, very good message. So you've been featured on many major media outlets, CNN, uh, ABC News, the Today Show, Larry King now, Huff Post or Hufferton Post. Yeah. Um, you know, you've been on Ed Milet's podcast, for yeah. example, someone that I really admire and someone that I actually get a lot of inspiration from, and that must have been very, very cool. He's incredible. He's a good man. Yeah. He's a great man. He's a top, top guy, and he's yeah. very all-rounded, you know, yeah. fit, strong, wealthy, good speaker, positive, yeah. you know, great, great person. Um and, and now your mission behind your foundation is help people going through mental health struggles, prevention of suicide and people taking their own life. You're a great speaker now, motivational speaker, kind of a mentor and a coach at the same time. And you're touring the world and, and getting your story out there. I mean, how do you go from someone that felt like you had no mission, no purpose, wanting to take your life and jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge to this, yeah, this influencer? That's what you want. You know, it's a, it's a purpose-driven life is what I say. You know, I, I, I'm driven by purpose. And I, I was reluctant to ever talk about what I went through. But in the hospital, in the psych ward I was in, after my physical hospital stay, after I, after I learned how to walk again, wearing a back brace, walking with a cane in the psych ward, a Franciscan friar, Brother George Cherry, comes into my room. And he says, hey, kid, what are you in for? And he's smiling. And I said, well, brother, I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he goes, yeah, and I'm the Pope. 
He didn't believe me. He thought I was delusional because I was in a psych ward. I was like, no, brother, that's why I'm putting on this back brace. That's why I walk with this cane. I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he goes, oh, I'm, I feel so silly. Let's pray. And so we're praying together. And he goes, kid, when you get better, you want to talk about this. And I was like, about what to who? He said, you'll see. Every day, Brother George Cherry would come to my room. Every day, he would pray with me the same prayers. Every day, at the end of the prayer, he would say, kid, when you get better, you want to talk about this. And every day, I would ignore him. On the last day of my stay, he goes, Kevin, I expect you'll talk about this. And I was like, see ya. You know, whatever, buddy, sure. Get out of the hospital, go to church with my dad, same church I grew up in as a kid, church I was confirmed in, got married in. And the priest comes out, Father Michael Harriman, and he comes out and he goes, Kevin, how would you like to come and talk to our seventh and eighth grade class about your experience this Good Friday? And I said, Father, I don't have a speech and I wouldn't know what to say. And my dad shoved me forward and goes, he'll do it. I was like, what are you doing? He goes, you'll do it. We need closure. I'm like, you need closure, old man. I need to go home and lay down. <laughs> but I didn't say that out loud. He's 6'1", and I'm not. Um, so so I uh, anyway, I, I, I go and I talk to these kids. 128th grade, 7th, 8th grade kids. I'm thinking to myself, who is this going to help? What the hell am I doing? Eight hands go up after the presentation. And I was crying and shaking during the whole talk because it was so raw. It was seven months after my attempt. And the, the, the kids asked these questions, and they're all great questions, empowering, moving, intelligent questions, uh, important questions. And I, I was like, did that just make an impact? Okay, cool. Then I went home and didn't think about it. Two weeks later, Father Harriman calls me to the rectory. I go there, I hook up two miles, my back brace and my cane, took two hours. I get there, sweating through my back brace, having an asthma attack. And the priest says, Hand me, hands me a vanilla envelope. I open it up. It's a hand penciled colored drawing by one of the kids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, really beautifully done. Open that up, 120 letters from 120 kids. Obviously, they were mandated to write the letters, you know. Nonetheless, they were given no parameters on what they could write. They were told to write me to their heart's content. Six of the kids wrote of their active suicidal crisis. Because the letters were screened, because they were minors, those kids were given the help they needed. They're alive today. Two of them are therapists. When that happened, when the initial part of that happened, my father read the letters and said, Kevin, we have to do this however, wherever, and whenever possible, and we can't stop. And from there, I created, with my wife, uh, first of all, a, a company uh, that we, we run for, for, for speakers, and then we created a second company uh, to uh, a, a film production company. And so we make documentaries, kind of like you do, we make documentaries um, about topics like suicide prevention, brain and mental health, social justice issues, things like that. And um, our last documentary, Suicide the Ripple Effect, was seen by over 2 million people in 20 countries. Um, it, it won six international film awards. Uh, and we're making a movie right now called The Net. And The Net is a film about the near 90-year battle to raise the net at the Golden Gate Bridge and stop the suicides there once and for all. And the best part of it all is that the net is on the Golden Gate Bridge being constructed right now, thanks in great part due to the bridge, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge district, the people who own and run the bridge, but thanks in great part to the foundation my father and I co-founded called the Bridge Rail Foundation. Uh, and, and that Paul Muller is the president of and Dave Hall is the vice president. And the Bridge Rail Foundation is the largest dog in the fight to raise it at the Golden Gate Bridge to stop suicides there. And they and all the people who lost their loved ones there, and all the people who are a part of the Bridge Rail Foundation, all the people that are connected in different mental health organizations fought tirelessly, as we did, my father and I, for 22 years to make this happen. It's being built right now, and as of 2023, likely in November, not one more person will ever again die off the Golden Gate Bridge, and it will become the largest, most powerful, and brightest beacon for suicide prevention right around the world. All right, round of applause to you, my friend. Smashed it. You know, um, when, when a group of like-minded people get together and they don't stop, they can do anything. Absolutely. I'm going to backtrack slightly because I actually forgot to ask you. Um, you. We got written down here, you wrote actually a suicide note in 2000. This is actually before you attempted, clearly, uh, to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. 
Was that linked, those two? So was it a suicide note, I'm going off now to the Golden Gate Yeah, Bridge. so that note was the night before. And that what was in that note? Uh, a message to my family and friends and my girlfriend. I said, I basically said, Mom, I love you, but you're not always right. I said, Dad, I love you, but stop bringing the office home. This isn't work. I said to my little brother who wanted to be the next greatest DJ in the world, I said, be a household name. I said to my sister Elizabeth who wanted to make films, you got this, go get it. I said to my best friend at the time, you'll find another best friend. And I said to my girlfriend at the time, it's not you, it's me, which I regret. But anyway, uh, it was just, uh, I wrote that, I asked for their forgiveness, and I told them I loved them. In hindsight, I wish I just walked into my dad's room and told him my truth. He would have stopped me. And that's the message I want to get to the audience here in, here in London. If you are in lethal emotional pain, please find someone willing to empathize with it and don't stop until you do. Yes, it might not be your family who doesn't understand. It might not be your closest friends because they can't comprehend losing you and they don't want to be hurt by you. But you will find someone willing to empathize with your pain. And I want to say this. If, you are, if you're suicidal right now and you're struggling to cope, I want you to call the Samaritans for free at 116-123-UK and Republic of Ireland. You are important. You matter. Suicide is not the answer. It's the problem. And remember this. Live by this. Suicidal ideations are the greatest liars we know. We don't have to listen to them. There, there's an amazing organization. I, I know. Uh, 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 what is the demographic of your, your listeners and your viewers, like age, age, age range wise? Do you know? Yeah, there's two lots. There's actually a younger lot, yeah. 18 to 24, 25. And okay. then I have uh, a, another age group, like, you know, mid 30s to like early 40s. Okay. All right. So for the, for the teenager group, the, the younger group, uh, there's a great organization out here called STEM4. Um, you know, Tom Holland pushes them a lot. He, 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 really, he really likes them. But they have so many aspects of the work they do and the programs they release that help people, teenagers and above, who are really struggling mentally. And they, 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 they cover topics like anxiety, depression, self-harm. Uh, they cover eating disorders and addictions. Um, and I think it's really important uh, that we give them the resources they deserve. So if you, if, you, if you are looking for someone you love to get the help they need, it's a great organization. STEM number four. What are some of the projects, other missions, other things that you're doing, promoting, and active on right now, Kevin? So right now, um, right now, to all those listening and watching, follow me at Kevin Hines Story, K-E-V-I-N-H-I-N-E-S-S-T-O-R-Y, on Instagram, uh, because we are we are, we have a movement going on there 24 hours a day where we are putting up content that is absolutely changing lives people write into those videos those reels and say this saved my life this changed my life forever uh, you can go to youtube.com slash Kevin Hines uh, there are 600 I believe in 50 videos all designed to better your brain health they are for everyone they are for anyone over the age I would say of nine if you're struggling right now and you want to find some true inspiration, youtube.com slash Kevin Hines and, and leave comments. Tell us how the video affected your life and how, how it helps you if it does. Um, there's a video in particular. If you know someone who's suicidal, there's a video on that channel called Please Stay. It is a call to anyone having suicidal thoughts right now to get them to be here tomorrow. And um, there's a particular video that anyone can use to balance their brain health called The Art of Wellness 2.0. The Art of Wellness 2.0 is a 10-step guide in video form, 16 minutes of your life, well worth it. You follow that guide, people from all over the world as far as Peru, Africa, China, Japan, Canada, UK, Ireland, uh, and beyond have said that by following these 10 steps, these common sense tools that are science-backed, evidence-informed, proven to change your life, by following them for six to nine months, they see a dramatic improvement in their mental well-being. So those are, those are the ways, you, and, and you can reach me at Kevin Hines Story on, on any socials, or you can find me at YouTube. Uh, I do respond to all my comments. 
I want to say thank you very much for your time today, mate. It's been a very, very moving story. I'm definitely inspired. I've definitely learned a lot as well. There is one more question. Of course. I've got my own mantra, probably more business-led mantra, but I've actually pushed it into most of my life, and it goes like this. Be happy, never content. I've got my own interpretation of what that means. If I were to ask Kevin Hines, what does the interpretation of be happy, never content mean to you? So there are three constants in our lives. Pain, uncertainty, pain, uncertainty, and consistent hard work. I would say to be happy, you've got to put in the work. Never be content with the self you are today. Always build for tomorrow. That's how I see it. That's an excellent breakdown. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, brother. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe, share, do all the good stuff. Follow my guests over here and uh, remember to be happy, never content. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Mm -hmm.